Okay, okay. Oh, 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 I tell you, when Nebuchadnezzar, whoo, when he built that statue, and he said when they heard the music, that they were all to bow before that statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will not bow. They did not bow, and they got turned in for not bowing. And they were told by Nebuchadnezzar, so he brings them in before him. And he says, if you will bow now when you hear the music, uh, you, uh, you won't be thrown in the fiery furnace. But if you will not bow... You will burn. And he said, and who is that God that can deliver you from my hand? Whoa! And they said, we do not answer you carefully, Nebuchadnezzar. Our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand. And we will not bow. We will not bow. And Nebuchadnezzar had used these three wise men in his courts. He loved these three men, but his disposition, his countenance, he became furious. And he said, heat that furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been heated before. And he said, bind their hands and throw them in the furnace. And so they bind their hands and they throw them in the furnace. And he had his mighty men throw them in. And the furnace was so hot that it killed the mighty men that threw the three Hebrew children into the furnace. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he was alarmed. And he stood up and he said, did not we throw three men into the fiery furnace bound. And they said, oh, yes, Lord. He asked all of his counselors. They said, oh, yes, king. We threw three men in the fiery furnace bound. He says, I see four men walking in the fire, and, and no harm has come to them. And the fourth man has the look of the Son of God. And he says, I make a decree. I make a new decree that any man who would speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut in pieces by the sword and their houses will be made a dunghill because there is no God who can deliver with the power of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So true that is. Cindy, would you come? Cindy wants to share a poem with us. Cindy writes poetry. Wonderful job. That was good. I'm glad she came up here. Do you know it's a wonderful season, but sometimes this is one of the hardest seasons for people. And the devil would like us to bow to every disappointment and every sorrow, not only that happened just, just this last year, but over a lifetime, trying to make it into a, a big old hill that we can't get past. That's why a lot of people just have a hard time with the holidays. So we're just not going to bow to sorrows. But anyways, like many of you, um, there was an empty chair at our table. Uh, of course, because of loved ones that have gone on. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to read this this morning, not only to honor them, but for somebody here. So this this uh, is a poem about Gary's mother. And the the name of it is, that, That's Heaven's Treasure to Me. Now, loved ones have not been lost. They are a treasure. And they are safely waiting on the other side for us, safely, in a wonderful place. But anyway, as you all know, Gary's mother was a faithful Christian, and she faced many trials. Her husband did not get saved until he was about 70. Those sons gave her a run for their money. Could I hear an amen from the back corner? But he was faithful. 
he was faithful. So, a treasure, a mother who loved, a mother who cared. Oh, my mother of faith who stood fast in prayer. My mother of tears who never gave up. My mother of joy who did drink life's bitter cup. Until the wind of his spirit swept over this soul and salvation's grand peace Oh, made this sinner whole. While angels were singing amazing grace, the portal of heaven, yes, Calvary's place, the cross and the love, just like Mama had said, the place of redemption for the lost and the dead, rebirth of a soul now washed in his blood, no longer to wander, to Christ I had come. Now Mama's in heaven. She's finished her race. She laid down her body in peace and in faith. She's waiting in heaven, those pearly gates, for loved ones who trusted before too late. Now Jesus and Mama, that's heaven to me, where angels and harps still praise his name. And death and sickness have all moved away, where the joys of his glories changed night into day. And can I say something here for somebody that may be missing someone that you used to pick the phone up and you used to call them and they always used to have the answer and they always used to know how to pray and they were praying for you and cared if they've moved on let me tell you something the holy spirit came and jesus is here and i have a good report for you today he cares and if nothing else is underneath that christmas tree this year that you wanted you thought you needed jesus will be there Thank you, Cindy. Wonderful, wonderful words of encouragement. Amen. Is anybody happy yet? Yeah. All right. Poach your neighbor and say, wake up. He's going to preach now. Mm. What a wonderful Thanksgiving we had. I want to thank my wife, my mother-in-law for cooking for us. Somebody said, did you have a relaxed time? I said, yeah, I just sat in my chair and watched my wife cook. It was wonderful. I got off my diet for two days, which is okay. It was worth it. But we had a great time. I trust you did too. But I did read something that, that I need to follow instructions on, and that's uh, this time of the year you need to get your bathroom scales out and turn them back 10, about 10 pounds, you know. Then you don't feel so bad. All right, we're going to look at Ephesians this morning, chapter 1. In your notes, there's a mistake. Somewhere it says Ephesians 12. This is not an Ephesians 12. It's Ephesians 1. And in all honesty, I looked at that in my proofreading, and I thought I got to change that, and I didn't. I just printed it off just like that. So we're in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to talk this morning about when are we accepted by God. In verse 4, let's start. The Bible says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Would you say that with me? Accepted in the beloved. That's what we're going to talk about. When are we accepted by God? And a lot of times we think, you know, that day that I, I came to my senses, the day that I, I realized I needed Christ in my life, that day that I knelt before Jesus and asked him to come into my heart and cleanse me of all my sins. Wonderful day that was. Sometimes we think that is the time that we were truly accepted by God when we finally cried out to him. But the truth is, in this scripture and other scriptures, we really didn't choose him. He chose us. And that's the most amazing thing. He looked down upon us before the foundation of the world, and he said, I want that person. I want that person. I want that person to be my son, to be my daughter. He chose us. He provided for us. And all provision has already been made. And that time that we did kneel before God and say, Lord, forgive me my sins. I accept you as my Savior. 
All the provision that we ever needed for salvation was already done. It was accomplished in the atonement 2,000 years ago. When Jesus died on that cross, he died for you and I. He made complete and total redemption. A work of the, of the sinful nature was completely removed all the way back to history from that present time all the way into eternity. And that's a powerful thought that one act of Jesus Christ dying on the cross eradicated, erased all of our sins. So when I bowed down before the Lord and I asked him to forgive me of my sins, what I really did is I accepted something that was already accomplished. And when I accepted something that was already accomplished, Jesus accepted me, not at that time, but he accepted me way back when he did it. He said, the provision is there for you. All you have to do is receive it. God made provision for you before you ever sinned. God made provision for you before you were ever born. God made provision for you before he even created this world. From the foundations of the world, God looked down through eternity. And at a time, he said, my son's going to die for their sins. And here's the problem that we have as Christians. is A lot of times we're trying to become accepted by God. If only I can work a little harder. If I can only do a little bit more. If only I can sacrifice more. Maybe I can be accepted by God. Maybe I can earn somehow his love and his appreciation and his favor in my life. Several years ago, my family and I, we went up to uh, northern British Columbia. And a friend of mine was with the Clinkin Indians. He was a missionary to the Clinkin Indians. And he started a church up there. And I wanted to go up and, and see his work. And he allowed me to preach in the church. We had a great time. And then Monday, we went out fishing. Man, went to a place called Atlan Lake. They got the biggest trout there I've ever seen in my life. We caught trout. Wonderful. And then the next day, he said, I want to take you to another lake. It's called Little Atlan Lake. Little Atlan Lake is known for pike fishing. Now, I've never, at that time, I'd never caught a pike before. Anybody ever catch a pike? I, didn't, I, I wasn't even real sure what a pike looked like, but I said, I want to go. And, and he said, this is the lure. And he gave me this lure. And he said, you use this lure. And he said, you'll catch fish. And I tell you what, we caught so many fish, we filled up two boats with pike. It was wonderful. Came back home, and then we decided to go over to my, our, our family back in Idaho. And, and I looked up my brother, and, and, and my brother told me, you know what? Said Lake Coeur d'Alene. They just planted a bunch of pike in Lake Coeur d'Alene. Fish and game didn't plant it. A bunch of guys snuck in there and dumped pike into it, you know. And so all these pike are in Lake Coeur d'Alene. He says, let's go fishing. I said, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm like an old pro at this, you know. I, one day I fished pike, and I, I figured out how to do it. And, and my brother Ken, he said, well, I've never caught a pike in my life. He said, I've tried and tried and tried. So let's just go on out. And so we go out there, and we park, and, and I threw my lure out there. The very first time I cast, I caught a pike. Nice big one. My brother's eyes were that big. He's looking at me, and, and I pulled it in, and, uh, and I was looking at that thing. I was holding it up, and, and he made a statement that just really, at that time, it shocked me, but it stuck with me even to this day. He said, God must really love you. And I said, why would you say that? He said, because I've been fishing these pike for months, and I haven't caught one. And your very first cast, you caught a pike. God must love you. And so I stopped him there. I said, Ken, are you saying you believe God loves me more than he loves you? He said, yeah, he does. I said, why would you say that? He said, well, number one, he said, you started off your early life in the ministry, and you give, devoted your whole life to the ministry, and God's favor is on you, and he just loves you. And I said, well, you're not called to the ministry. I understand that. My, my brother was a police officer. I said, but you got a calling from God, too. Somebody's got to be a police officer. We need good Christian police officers. I said, God doesn't love me any more than he loves you. The fact is, God loves every one of us as much as he will ever love us. He will never love us any more than he loves us right now. No matter where we are in life, no matter what we have or haven't done for the Lord, he loves you. And, and because you make your profession in ministry of some sort does not mean God loves you more than God loves somebody else. And that's something that gets twisted in our minds as we think God does not love me as much as he loves another person. So I cannot receive from God the blessings of the Lord until I arrive at that place where somebody else perhaps is that the blessings of God are in his life. God loves you. He will never love you any less. And he will never love you any more 
no matter what you do or how much sacrifice you make in life, God loves you. So there's absolutely nothing you can do to make him love you more or make, you love you, make him love you less. So religion comes along, and here's what religion says. God loves you in proportion to your performance. All religions are based on that. If you work harder, if you do more, if you give more, then God will love you more. But that's not true. The fact is, you are not accepted by God because of what you do. You're accepted by God because of what Jesus Christ did. We put our hope and our trust 100% in what he has done for us. The fact is, you have already been forgiven completely. All your sins of the past, they're gone completely. He loves you and his favor is upon you. I want you to consider this for a moment. If the Lord were to ask you to sit down and write a letter to a church 2,000 years in the future from now, what would you say? What would you say to people 2,000 years down the road from now? Most people would say something like this. Oh, God, I ask you to pour out your spirit on that generation. I want you to send revival and move in a mighty way. Lord, do a new thing on the earth in that day. And, and most people would pray that way because they would want God to come reveal himself to them. But basically, the whole prayer would be this. God, do something. God, do something. Sometimes we pray that prayer even in our lives today. The Apostle Paul prayed the exact opposite. The Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.17. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. In other words, there's a huge difference between what we would pray, oh God, go and touch that person, and what Paul prayed. He prayed, Lord, please help them see and help them understand what you have already done. This whole series of what I'm developing, started last week, I'm going to go on it for a few weeks, is that we might see what Jesus has already done and provided for us, what we already have, that it might build our faith and build our prayer life. When you know what, you got, what God has already done, you can pray with confidence. I want you to consider this. Jesus Christ loves people more than we could ever love them. He loves your relatives. He loves your neighbors. He loves our community more than we could possibly love them. Our prayers will not make God love them anymore. Think about that. Because sometimes we fall into this trap, and I've done this myself. I said, Lord, if you only love this person half as much as I do, you would touch them. So somehow I'm trying to get God to love this person a person that he already loves more than I could possibly love. The point is, God loves your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers, your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, that you're praying for. God loves them more than you do. And try to manipulate God to love them like you do is not going to work. God loves them more than you do. He wants all to get saved. He wants them all to come to repentance. But many people believe they have to convince God to do something by pleading or begging or hoping that somehow he will change his mind to get people saved. The Bible says it's his will that all people get saved. God wants people to get saved. We talk about revival. But revival does not come by begging God to pour out his spirit. Neither will revival come by pleading with God to move and do what we call a new thing. How does revival come? It comes by starting with us to believe what God has already done in and through our lives and begin to act upon that. You know when revival is going to break out? It's when we begin to share what God has done in our hearts with other people. And we begin to tell them about the goodness of the Lord. And somebody's life is radically transformed. When that person is radically transformed, they're going to start a fire. They're on fire. They're going to start a fire. When people come to the church and we take what God has already given us, his spirit, this power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in us, and we begin to pray for people. And not only are spiritual eyes blind, but literal eyes who are blind are open. When dead people come back 
to life, when those things begin to happen, revival is going to break out. Things are going to take place because these are going to happen. But it's not going to happen because we say, God, do a new thing. It's going to happen because we realize what God has already done. He's already given us his authority and his power. So everything we call revival, we can see it happen in the life of Jesus. But the Bible talks about Jesus said himself. He said, everything I do, I do because I, I, I have, I've done it because the Father showed me to do it. I'm led of the Spirit, in other words. Heal this person, touch that person, cast out the devils, raise the dead. All these things, Jesus was led to do all these things. He did only what he saw his father do, Jesus said. So revival comes when we seek the Lord with our whole heart, 100%. And we begin to believe and draw out and flow in what God has already done. We don't need anything more than what he's already given us. It's a matter of getting it out of our spirit into our emotions and through our flesh and ministering to people. Somebody put it this way. If you, if you catch on fire for God, people will come and just watch you burn. Let the Holy Spirit burn in your life. Let what God has already created in your life, let it come to reality and fruition and let it come forth from your life and people will see it. So being accepted by God, it changes our prayer life. Being accepted by God will bring a brand new revelation. When Paul prayed, he didn't pray for us to experience something new. Look at it again. Ephesians 1.15 Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you. What is he going to give to us? Is he going to give to us a new thing? Is he praying for another outpouring? Is he praying for a brand new wave? All these cliches we throw out there? No. He said, I pray this, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, Paul wasn't asking for something new. But he's asking for a revelation of what God has already done that already resides within us, that it might begin to come out. Wisdom, revelation has already been given to every single believer. Whatever it is you have need of, our God has already supplied it through what Jesus did on the cross. We need to understand that. We need to get that in our lives. He, we don't need anything more. We need to release what is there. For example, you might be fearful. You might be afraid. You might be concerned. You might be anxious. You might be facing a temptation in life and you just can't overcome it. Maybe you feel like sin just keeps beating you down. You try to be a Christian and then you keep falling away. You come back and you keep falling away. You keep going through this yo-yo type of experience and you say, if only I can get to the place where I can stand. You know what you need to do? You need to stop focusing on what you can't do and focus on what the Word of God says you are. You know what the Bible says you are? The Bible says I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. So when sin raises its ugly head against me, I can defeat sin through Jesus Christ. I am more than a conqueror today through Christ Jesus. Not sometime in the future. Not when I get my act totally together. Not when I'm praying five hours a day and fasting two days a week. But right now, I already have it. It's mine. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. If you have a problem with sin in your life, you have to realize Jesus Christ defeated sin for you. And he's made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Already, the Bible says, you've been transformed from that sinful nature, from all unrighteousness, from an unholy lifestyle to righteousness and to a holy lifestyle. Because it's not a work we can do, it's a work that he has done for us. The Bible says we've already been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And we've been translated in the kingdom of his dear son. Kingdom of light. So it's already been accomplished. It's already been done. Jesus isn't going to do it again. He already did it. Listen to this. This is what the Bible says. The very same life and wisdom and victory and anointing and faith that Jesus had, you have. It's in you right now. This spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. And it will quicken your mortal body. 
You don't need really more of anything else. We need a revelation of what we already have, that we will have a full revelation of our potential in Jesus Christ. To see what Paul said, the glory of his riches. The word glory is kabod. It's the heavy weight of God's presence. In the Old Testament, the, the glory of God resided on the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubims that faced each other, there was this blue fire that was there. And, and only the high priest could even go in and minister before the Lord one day out of the year, and he had to be pure to do so. It was a place of holiness, but where that blue fire of God's glory was, was the secret to all of Israel's success. Wherever they went, the Ark of the Covenant went with them, and, and every enemy fell before them. That blue fire of God's glory is not between the cherubims today. God's glory is in your heart and your life. And friend, that's a revelation. If we could ever catch a hold of it, it would, it would transform us so radically. It would change everything who we are and what we think. Because I don't know about you, but when I got up this morning and I looked in the mirror, unfortunately, I put my glasses on first. You know, if I don't have my glasses on, it's not so bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I happened to be out in the living room. I put my glasses on. I had to find something. I looked in the mirror. I thought, huh. <laughs> Few flaws there. You know what I'm saying? Few flaws. Thank you. Yeah. Say hello. No, don't. In my flesh... We all do. We have flaws. In our emotions, in our soul, in our personality, in our character, we have flaws. But what we need to realize is when Jesus Christ came and said, I'll make you a new creation, that spiritual part of us became brand new. It's, not re, it's just not remade. It's not the old man warmed over. It's a new creation. It's brand new. And that new creation, that new spirit, has no flaws. And the Holy Spirit can live in that spirit and he works his way through the rest of us. You see, the process of what we call sanctification or renewing of the mind is that we're trying to get our emotions, we're trying to get our will, we're trying to get our personality to line up with what God has already placed in our spirit. But as far as our spirit is concerned, there is the glory of God that is there. That very same glory of God that caused nations to quake and to tremble before the very presence of Almighty God. It's in your life. And I know sometimes when I say that, people just back off and say, no, that's not me. I'm not at that place yet. Well, are you going to believe what your thinking is telling you, what other people are telling you? Or are you going to believe what the Word of God says? What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says that the glory is in you. And Paul was praying that you might have a revelation to know that you can see the glory of the inheritance. And he calls us something. He calls us saints. Well, in most of the church world today, you have to do certain things to come into sainthood. You know, you got to fast so often. You have to feed the poor. You have to, you know, do a miracle. And then when you die, somebody's going to get up and say, ah, let's bring him into sainthood. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you are a saint. Isn't that an amazing thing? I'm a saint. You're a saint. Now, when I looked in the mirror this morning, I didn't see a saint. I had to trim my eyebrows. They needed some work. Couldn't even find the scissors. I had to ask my wife, where's the scissors? It was, yeah. There's flaws and imperfections, but most of the time, because of who we are as human beings, all we see is the physical. And all we hear many times is the emotional that comes out. But deeper than all that is the spirit that God has raised from the dead and he's created something new in our heart and our life. And he says there are no flaws there. How can we come boldly into the throne room of grace without petitions to be made known before the Lord into a place that has total holiness where no sin can ever be admitted? But Jesus said you can come boldly into his presence only because in our spirit it's a work that Jesus did for us. If we get that into our heart and get that into our lives and get that into our minds, that can drive away all fear. That can drive away all depression. That can drive away all anxiety in our life. That can make us to the place where we actually believe. But the Bible says you are sons and daughters 
of the Most High. You can believe, if I may say so, because it's in the Bible. You are right now kings and priests unto God. Now, I've had the fortune in my life, and some of you have too, to meet some extremely, not only godly men and women, but walked in the supernatural on a level that was just almost unbelievable. And I remember one man that I, I really began, he became my friend, and, and this guy had the word of knowledge unlike anybody I'd ever seen. He used to travel with Catherine Kuhlman back years ago, and he'd, he'd preach all the afternoon services in Catherine Kuhlman's crusades. And uh, his name was Jerry B. Walker, very well known down south. Um, and, and, and he came to our church, and him and I became really good friends. And I'd sit down, and man, I'd just ask him questions. I went to his house. Sharon and I went to his house. Just I want to see how he lived. And I really didn't see a great difference in how he lived versus how I lived or anybody else. Except for one thing. He really believed he was a king. He really believed it. You talk to him, he would never demean himself. He was a child of the king. He conducted himself like he was a king. He dressed like he was a king. He acted like he was a king. He acted like he truly represented Jesus Christ. And when he came into our church, I remember this Sunday he came in, I had him there for two weeks. When he came in, the first thing he said from the pulpit was, he said, Jerry B. Walker is here in Roseburg, Oregon. And when I drove in, I saw the devil driving south. And he says, I'm getting out of here because Jerry B. Walker's in town. I thought, what kind of arrogance is that? When the services were over, I knew what he was talking about. He walked in and he took authority as a child of God. And when he prayed for people, he believed his prayers were going to be answered, and they were. When he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to his heart and his life, he spoke what the Holy Spirit told him to speak. Then the result, after two weeks for us, we saw a lot of people come back to the Lord, but we documented it all. There were 200 people that got saved for the very first time in two-week period of time. And I couldn't tell you how many people were healed of all kinds of diseases. Was it because God loved Jerry B. Walker more than he loves you or I? Is it because he lives a different kind of lifestyle than we do? It's because he believes. He believes. And if you go back to any of these, these you know, any ministers out there today or years gone by, and if you look at the lifestyle, the one thing that distinguished them in success from those that don't, is that they really believe the Word of God. They believe it. And if you ever heard their songs, you guys have been in tent meetings before. Listen to the songs they sang. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Have faith in God. Have faith. They would sing it and sing it and sing it until they built people's faith and expectation to the place where they received miracles. Oral Roberts used to always have in the back of his tent to expect a miracle. And when you come expecting and believing, the miraculous and the supernatural take place. So this whole thing of what we're trying to accomplish and we're trying to achieve in life, we want to see God work through our lives. We want to see our children saved, our grandchildren saved. We want to see people healed. We want to see miracles take place. We want revival to happen. It's not going to happen because God comes down and does something brand new. It's going to kind of happen because we realize this is what the Lord has done for us. He's already provided for us now. It is in my spirit. And I need to begin to release that thing from my heart and from my life and allow the Holy Spirit to move in people's lives. What a wonderful revelation. If you focus your attention on who you are in Jesus, if you focus your attention on Christ, recognizing who he is and what he's done, and that it's a done deal, that you have the glory of God in your life, and it can be released any time you desire it to be released, you start enjoying victory. And as one guy put it, he said, you'll put a shout in the fence post if you realize that's going to happen in your life. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. So you got unsaved loved ones? God loves them. God loves them. I've said this before. I remember the day I was, I was praying. I used to pray this every day I'd come before the Lord because my oldest son had fallen away. And I said, God, I said, save my son. Oh, God, and I used to pray that prayer. If you only love him as much as I love him, 
Save him. Oh, God, save him. Somehow just show him, just show him that you love him. God, just save him. And I prayed and I prayed every single day. I got to the place where I was agonizing in prayer, literally agonizing. My, my, my spirit was hurting because he wasn't serving God. And one day as I was praying, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, stop praying like that. I, said, I don't want you to pray like that anymore. I said, what do you mean, Lord? And he said, you, 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 you're doing it all wrong. He says, I want you to leave him in my hands. Let me work the work in his life. And just back off and just thank me for what I'm doing. And so I did. And about three weeks later, he had gotten out of, graduated out of high school. He moved in with a girl, and they were living together. And about three weeks later, both of them come to church. And I got up, and I preached a sermon. No clue what I preached. I can't remember. But I do remember this, is at the end of the service, I said, anybody here want to get saved or renew your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Would you lift up your hand? And two hands went up. My son and his girlfriend. I invited them to come to the front to the altar. They rededicated their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You met my son, Shane. He's been here. He's, he was here last Sunday, I think. And, and they gave their life to the Lord, and, and the Lord spoke to me and said, just let me do it. I love him. Who is it you're praying for? What is it you're praying for? What is it you have need of in life? No matter what it is, just put it in the hands of the Lord and say, God, see, that's faith. I know that you care. Do you care about my finances? Do you care about my family? Do you care about my future? Do you care about my future husband or wife? Do you care about anything that, that I'm dealing with today? you care about it more than I do? I'm not trying to get you to move on my behalf. I want you to move through my life, flow through my life. And my faith is I believe, God. I believe, like the kids sang this morning, I believe it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. I believe that it's going to take place. My healing is going to take place. I believe salvation is coming to my family. I believe that miracles are going to happen. I believe finances are going to come from so many different directions. I believe I'm going to receive that job. Whatever it is we have need of, it's a matter of, do you believe it? With God, all things are possible. Isn't that true? Just put it in his hands. Again, where we're going with this whole thing is we're not going to try to bring something down new. We don't need something new. We need to, an understanding, a revelation of what Jesus Christ has done for us. When he said it's finished, that means it's done. And when he cried it was finished, as we know, it was not the cry of a defeated man. There's a cry of victory from the cross. Jesus was saying it truly. I defeated hell. I defeated Satan. I defeated every work. Jesus, the Bible said Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And anything the devil is trying to do in your life, Jesus will destroy that if you believe. Amen? All right. I need you, Roseanne, if you would come. Boy, it's good to see you all this morning. Looking around here. You guys have come from Thanksgiving, overfed like me, and you come to church and you give thanks to the Lord. Some of you I haven't seen in a while. See Isaiah over here. He's in military school. Good to see Isaiah. You're looking good, brother. I keep up with you on Facebook. I never post on Facebook. I can't. I can't tell you why. I just got this phobia. God has, to, God has to deliver. If it's out there, you can't take it back. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I see what's happening. Your mom talks about you a lot. She's proud of you. Your parents are proud of you. And we're proud of you. It's good to see you. And I see others of you that are here this morning. You're not feeling good. I know you're not feeling good. You know, you've been struck with the virus, but you wanted to come to church. Some of you, you want to come to church because it's church time. and Others, your children were singing, and you didn't want to miss that. May God bless you. Because I know it's, it, it is a sacrifice. You'd much rather be home and just sitting there and, and you know, drinking whatever it is you drink when you're sick. What do you drink when you're sick? No, anybody. Chicken soup fruit juice and you could be there drink water 
but you come to church and you're here. May God bless you with a healing today. A healing today. That that virus is going to be gone in the name of Jesus. He's good, isn't he? Lord, we just pray this morning that you just come and touch your church. Touch your people right now, Father. May we have a revelation that Paul prayed of your goodness in our life, of your power, of your work, of your glory in our heart and in our soul and our spirit. May we have a revelation of Jesus in us. Lord, you called us saints. May we walk as true sons and daughters of the Most High, as children of the King. And Lord, may we never put down or discredit the work that you have done in our hearts and lives. And I thank you for your goodness. And I thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, for a moment, if you would, just stay in an attitude of prayer. just want to ask a quick question. 